Salutations and welcome to the Pride of Detroit POD cast, Pride of Detroit.com, Pride of Detroit on Twitter, Pride of Detroit on Facebook. You know where to find us. Pride of Detroit brought to you now on twitch.tv slash Pride of Detroit, where we are live and now partnered. That's right. We have moved up from affiliate to partner on Twitch. Very big news. Uh, the, the coverage, you guys coming to us during draft season, put us over the top. We are now a partner on Twitch. It means uh, more emotes, more fun, enhanced features, and the community just gets greater and greater. So follow us, twitch.tv slash Pride Detroit, and download the POD cast on Stitcher, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, wherever you get podcasts. Do what you got to do. I am Chris Perfett, the adequate host at Chris Perfett, P-E-R-F-E-T-T on Twitter. Uh, being very clammy today, this is not uh, your boy is fighting through. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. I'm just sick. It's, it's random, random sickness. So we turn over to someone who is not as sick as me, perhaps the most unsick person on this podcast. Jeremy Reisman, the fearless leader, mustacheless once more at Detroit on Lion, editor in chief of Pride of Detroit. How are you, Jeremy? I am good. And, and yes, physically, definitely not sick. Mentally, that's that's for the listener to decide. Mm, I don't think you get to qualify as sick there. Okay. I don't Good. think you're, you're you're still you're still on the well, let's 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 turn it over. Let's bring in now the third man and expert on mental uh on mental being thereness and no, I wouldn't want to say mental sickness, but being thereness. The third man, Ryan Matthews. At Ryan underscore P O D. Ryan, how would you judge Jeremy's uh, mental being. I would say that he's disturbed because I think he's down with the sickness. Don't you? Ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> damn it. I don't the don't, door. don't tee stuff up and not expect me to hit it out of the park. Do, is damn it time it. to bring in the two a theme? <laughs> no, no, there is never a time to bring in the two a theme anymore. <laughs> Unless the Lions trade for Tua, which is not going to happen. Oh, don't, oh, no, don't we're you, already going don't, into the Tua yeah, talk. Don't, don't, we're don't. We're getting into the Tua talk. Don't you, you put tell that on us. You can tell it's the off season now, officially the off season, as the draft is in the books because uh, we are now a little looser. We're a little, uh, as I said, some of us have like mental hangovers. Others of us are just uh, spinning and going nuts. And we are now entering the period where we're getting some. So we actually have a pretty news heavy POD cast this show for you. And we're going to get into that in a second, but we are in the off season, so except expect us to be a little little looser, a little more fun, maybe off topic in a couple of uh couple of episodes down the road. May is not where you need to worry about us. You need to worry about us when it hits June and July. List cast is around the corner though. List cast is around the corner. I think this year we might do something different. We might do it as a tier cast because we're doing so much on Twitch, we're going to put things into tiers. S tier, A, B, C. We'll put those wide receivers and quarterbacks in those tier. How do you feel about that, Ryan? I'm all for, you know, re I don't know, reworking the wheel. Is that what that is? I mean, the wheel works fine, but I'm 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 interested in seeing if we can make it rounder. I want to turn this into car talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more the more round wheels that we are inventing here at uh, <clears throat> Pride the Detroit Ford factory. The rounder the wheels, I I heard they roll the better. I don't know. That's That's I'm true. not a, not a big car guy, just if we want to start talking pistons, maybe I don't know. Absolutely, not. I don't want to talk about the pistons. Okay, right <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Enough. I I know exactly where they are in the standings. Like, oh, uh, you guys were I'm, talking about the basketball team. No, no, no. I'm a, I'm a gearhead. You guys got to remember this. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, it's time to get to work. And as I said, we have a news heavy POD cast because um, several things happened almost right after we got done with our. Uh, with our recap of the draft and there's quite a bit that's happened with the lions roster. So Jeremy, I feel like we, we were talking about this. I think, are we going to start? I think we are going to start with carry on Johnson. So the lions have earlier this week released carry on Johnson, who is going to be running back three on the roster by all accounts. Uh, the team loses their best pass blocker and he was put on waivers and very quickly, I would say picked up, by the Philadelphia Eagles. However, it has kind of shortened up 
the run the running back competition that was going to be there for the Lions. The Lions, of course, drafted Jermar Jefferson out of Oregon State in the seventh round. And his chances to maybe make the roster have maybe gone up. We're going to have to see what's going on here. But what was your first impression, Jeremy? I was surprised. I was. Um, you know, we we talked to Deuce Staley here on the, this podcast, and he told us what a complete back Carryon Johnson was, and he told everyone how important pass blocking is to the running back position. And as as you said, Carryon Johnson was the best option that they had there. Um, he was on the last year of his rookie deal, so it was a little bit over $2 million. I think they save a little bit over a million dollars by by waiving him. Um, but I don't know. I mean, they're putting a lot of faith into um, a rookie coming in and essentially taking over that RB3 spot. And is, is an RB3 spot the most important spot on the roster? Of course it isn't. The Lions have two good running backs in uh, in DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams that, that, can, that are more than capable, but... I mean, we're, we're Detroit. We know how, you know, how loose those running back positions are, how, how fragile the running back position is. Um, we've, we've seen plenty of these guys get injured and them have to go down. I mean, we're just two years removed from, do you remember all the running backs the lines went through in 2019? Bo Scarborough was signed midseason and, and Wes Hills and, like, all these guys' that, names that you're going to forget in a, in a couple of years. Um this guy, you know, the RB3 has potential to play. Carrion Johnson brought pass blocking skills. He could still catch the ball. Was he as effective as a runner as he was two years ago before all the knee injuries? Of course he wasn't. But he's a capable guy who knows what to do in case he needed to be a starter. And so now the Lions are going to have to rely on either Jamar Jefferson or Rakeem Boyd or Dedrick Mills, two undrafted guys. Basically guys who weren't selected in the first 250 picks of this year's draft uh, are gonna have, is going to have to slide in and, and probably play at least a little bit of a role, even if there aren't any injuries. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think here's the thing with the RB3 role, right, is that Carrion Johnson had a role carved out for himself as a third down back. So it was less like, you know, he's not so important because he's RB3 on the depth chart, but he was he's viewed as a as a as a workable viable piece of that running back room because of the distinct skill set that he had. So I think it was a little bit surprising from that standpoint. Ultimately though, I think the lions did a lot of, they did a lot of goodwill with the carry on Johnson waving because they do it now instead of later, they give him a chance to catch yes. on with the team rather than waiting until training camp to, to make that cut. And then all of a sudden carry on's caught scrambling. I'm not saying that's the only reason they made this move. They clearly drafted Jamar Jefferson in the seventh round, because Jeremy, like you said, a- as a runner, carry on looked like he lost a little bit. Okay. No and by a little bit, I mean, he, he definitely, he definitely lost a step. I think when it came, um, when it came to him as a runner. So maybe the Philadelphia Eagles need that pass blocking running back. And maybe that's why they picked him up because they clearly have some other guys there like Miles Sanders who can, um, you know, lead that running back group over there in Philly. But I, I think what the lions clearly tried to do with this move was they, they shored up the, the backup position with Jamal Williams. Like, they have a dynamite backup running back. I, I I would go so far as to say that I think Jamal Williams is probably in the top tier of, like, backup running backs in the NFL. And they have DeAndre Swift, so they have two guys. And I think that if any team goes into a season thinking, all right, we're going to lose running back one and running back two, well, then you're just pulling guys off the scrap heap anyways. Um, you know, you're, you're going to the waiver wire, you're, you're scourging. Um, or you're, you know, you're, you're looking all over the place to get it, to get a replacement. So at the end of the day, I think the lions did a real solid by carry on Johnson. They gave him, you know, an, an honorable release so that he could figure out somewhere else to go and catch on. And I think the lions are still kind of set at running back. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not too concerned with the position as a whole. Yeah. I, it, it sucks a little bit just because carry on was the one who, right. Like lions hadn't had a hundred yard running game since, since, uh, was it Reggie Bush? It was. Yep. Yeah, it was Reggie Bush in 2013. And, you know, carry on finally broke that damn mold. Now, obviously, it wasn't it wasn't anything spectacular. We still haven't seen a thousand yard season out of anyone the Lions have drafted since probably going back to Barry Sanders. And the, the ground game is still not there. But as Ryan said, it, it's it sucks a little because he's lost that step and he's he's from all accounts a great guy and you always want to root for the guy especially at a position like that and you hope for the upside to really work out but 
you look at the factors are kind of lined up against carry on as, as Ryan said, he, he lost a step. He's also not one of the guys that this new, this new regime like favored that was from the, that was from the old staff. I know do spoke well of him, but I feel like when, when they went and got Jermar Jefferson, maybe they didn't expect Jefferson to really be there. And they think he can compete a lot, a lot stronger, but I think it is a vote of confidence in in I mean in their confidence that they think they know what they have with Jefferson and that Johnson was just on the on the outside looking in uh in their mind. So yeah, like as you say, Philadelphia picked him up right away. Uh it's a good situation in that carry on gets a chance to go to another team right away before the cuts start coming down during during training camp you i mean he may not even make the final philadelphia roster he might not make the final lions roster here too it's just one of those what if situations now i got three points i want to make first yeah. there i think there's a lot of speculation out there from fans saying maybe carry on johnson asked for this i would say there's almost a zero percent chance of that zero percent um if first of all if you were to watch his twitch streams after getting waived uh, I believe he said his first interaction with Brad Holmes was Brad Holmes telling him that he's fired. So, and he didn't he didn't tell that story in a very pleasant way. Like like that was something that he enjoyed hearing. Um, so I, I think you can throw that theory out the window. Two, um, you you have to realize too, like Karen Johnson was never going to be a part of this team's future plans, and we've all kind of, you know, metaphorically thrown in the towel for twenty twenty one. So getting him reps in 2021, does it, does it do you any good in the long term? No, it doesn't. Does it do you any good in the short term? Maybe. Um, but ultimately, I, I understand potentially giving those reps, giving those opportunities to one of these rookies to see what you got. I, I am concerned. And to me, the, the concern isn't that you lose your number one and you lose your number two. The concern is just that you lose one of them because – how often do we see a coaching staff in modern day NFL that wants to basically have a workhorse back that's taking all of the carries, all of the reps, first down, second down, third down? I do think DeAndre Swift and, and Jamal Williams are both capable of being three down backs, and that's something to consider. Like that that third down role, I don't know if it would have even been here for Carry on Johnson because they might have just given it to Jamal Williams because he's a hell of a pass blocker as well. But at some point they're probably going to have to rely on whoever this RB3 is going to be to be either a significant role or at least a complementary role, and that that's a bit concerning. But that brings me to my third point, which is, listen, I'm team don't draft a running back. I'm team running backs don't have that much value. So I can't, like, I if I want to stay on <laughs> brand, I can't sit here and tell you losing carry on Johnson is a huge deal. Because I was going to say you you were like oh it's it's not a running back in the top two hundred fifty players drafted and I was almost about to call you out right. there but I figured I'm splitting hairs but no I mean the point being is if I think you can get a running back off of, you know out of free agency that can be a, a role player potentially even a starter or you can get a starter in the fourth or fifth round then I can't sit here and tell you that Jamar Jefferson doesn't deserve to be RB three as a seventh round pick he he certainly could get there I just think it's a little bit of risk for 2021. And are the Lions willing to take risk in 2021 for the potential betterment of 2022 and 2023? Probably. And should they be? Probably. It's still a bummer to see carry on go. I think uh, I, 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 I even had my fingers crossed that maybe he would get his legs back and be potentially RB2 this year. Um, I know that was very, very wishful thinking and didn't come true. And I don't know if, if that'll really ever come true for carry on ever again, since he's just, he's tied to that knee brace at this point. But overall, it, it's not it's not a huge loss. It's just kind of a, a demoralizing one a little bit for, for us that have been fans for him for the past three years. Yeah, it, it was more of a bummer to see him go as a as like as a human being, as like a sure. fun personality with the team. So it seemed like he almost I think we kind of talked ourselves into carry on Johnson like, oh, he can be the pass blocking running back and he's got a great personality. And look at the rest of the awesome personalities that they have in that room. And, you know. Dan Campbell and, and everybody that they've assembled seems like they have like a football is fun mentality. So carry on's going to fit right in here. And and to Jeremy's point, like, I mean, how often do we see guys like Antonio Gibson and James Robinson and guys who are low draft picks, UDFAs who end up playing significant roles with teams and all they needed was a shot because 
hate to break it to you, but running backs kind of tend to be a dime a dozen. So I'm not from that standpoint, Jeremy, I'm not even concerned about like RB three, like Jamar Jefferson, let it loose, man. If, if we're throwing in that metaphorical towel for 2021, if, if things go sideways with, you know, Swift and Williams and Jamar Jefferson is suiting up week seven starting. Cool, man. My, my only <laughs> quick concern there is just pass blocking tends to be the last thing a, a rookie learns in the NFL. It's, it's not an easy skill. Mm-hmm. And I think it's sure. something that I know, I know a lot of people say Jamar Jefferson's a physical guy and, and he should be able to do it, but it's not, he's not going to be able to do it out of the gate. Okay. So yeah. you're saying Aleem McNeil lions new rb4 <laughs> now we're talking <laughs> I just, I, the only other thing i want to add to this is i've seen some fans asking once again it's trying trying to do the min max on value saying well why couldn't you have tried to get a trade value for uh carry on johnson i really hate to break it to you no one's pick no one's calling you back if you're trying to trade carry on johnson maybe you're getting a seventh rounder out of him but that's just not the value as jeremy says running backs are a dime a dozen like I, you're, you're not getting any trade value out of this. The fact that they didn't try to trade him is not, is not a damning point and it should not be considered as such. If you're, if you, if you're getting mad at Brad Holmes, cause he didn't try to find trade value on carry on Johnson, you're playing too much Madden. Not to mention, you don't know if that's true because yeah. the, the one thing we learned about, we learned that carry on was getting waived on Wednesday night and it didn't go mm-hmm. through that day. So maybe, just maybe, someone leaks that Wednesday night and says, "Hey, we're about to wave carry on. Come get him." Mm-hmm. And guess yeah, what? Yeah, because it's, no one, it's, no one got him until. Well, then I, I, I think someone would say to that, like, "Oh, yeah, but they know they can get him off the waiver wire." And then to that, I would respond, "You don't. No, know. you don't. The waiver wire, the waiver wire works in a certain way, and Philadelphia was just the first one at the front of the line that expressed interest and got yeah. him." And you have to wonder, since they were what nine or ten or something, or. No, they were they were like twelve. I don't know. The yeah, waiver wire is based on draft order, so they were they were in the upper third, I would say. So you have to wonder if anyone else put in a waiver claim. I actually thought I actually expected him to clear waivers because of all the knee injuries, but you know, some people like you. you a lot of times you see a, a yeah, I believe they were six, pick. by the way. Yeah, oh. six. Before oh, that's they, right, because they before picking they traded Johnson, back. Yeah. I forgot about that. Good yeah. call. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, this this is the second former Lions running back that, that went to the Eagles and, and maybe they were they were happy with what they got before and saying like, oh, maybe they're letting another talented guy go. We'll see. Yeah, who knows? Or or again, carry on might not even make the roster. It's it's just hard to tell. It's hard to tell. Remember, right now we're all at 90, 90 guys. We're all at 90 guys and within, uh, I would say about four months, we got to figure out how to shorten that down to uh, 37 of them are going to be without work. Yep. Grim reality of the NFL. Yep. It gets uh, tight real fast. So I want to take a quick break. I think that's a good place to start. Good start. Good start. Even though I'm like holding down my guts right now. Uh, When we come back, I want to talk about what's happened with the tight ends. Uh, Josh Hill retired this week quite suddenly. And the Lions have already found his replacement. We're going to tell you who that is and why they made that move and other kind of fun things. And also on the show, we're going to talk at some point about a commitment to the offensive line in money. Someone got paid. We'll be right back on the Pride to Detroit POD cast. I know Antonio Gibson was a third round pick, but whatever, it's not a top... (laughs) Yeah, I, I still did. Call you up for that? I didn't even see. No, I, I don't I think, know. I think um, I was calling out on something. So Jeremy got called out when the Eagles were in the in the waiver, yeah, I and I think I got called out. Um, I think it's still a fifty-three man roster. I think those two are still. Yeah, LJ. I think those are still for the uh, practice squad, as you say. I still think it's a, uh, unless I miss some other change, but I'm not used to it. Yet. Um. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, we're gonna all have to kind of remember what sort of roster changes last year was temporary for COVID, and which one was part of the sure. new CBA because they both happened at the same time. So uh, we'll have to split those hairs when when it's time. But um, yeah, absolutely. Let but me let's get to some alerts. Yeah, and yeah, by yeah. the way, once again, partnered on Twitch because of you guys. Yes. First of all, good. obviously, I have to call out no decaf. Whoever that handsome man may be for I don't his know who that is. ten month subscription using his Twitch. Maybe Prime. he's part of this this mysterious figure who is part of the team Pride of Detroit, Ooh. which we now have because we are a partner. Someone else could join that team, but um, they don't stream too much on Twitch anymore. I don't know how it works. <laughs> 
Uh, then thank you to Hustles and uh, Ma There Fuck Kerr for the follow. Um, Gonna get us there. There goes partnership, everyone. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. Uh, then Lefty gifted out five gifted subs. Thank you, Lefty. How many? I gotta scroll up to see how many you've given this so far. 370 to the channel. You insane person, but thank you. Appreciate the continued support out of you. Tyrant Lizard Rex for the follow as well. London Lion subscribed for nine months using tier one and Gus J or Gus F. Jord, uh, or uh, probably Gus Fjord, if I'm if I know how to read uh, with the follow. Appreciate that as well. What happens in ten months? Frog Whore wants to ask. I don't know. I don't know. By the way, um, it is a very blessed Monday. Monday. Uh, I feel like we should start off our Twitch version of that to bless up because our Lord and Savior has risen, as was said and prophesied. Uh, shout out to Jacksonville. I hope you guys are happy with Urban Meyer. Oh, Jesus. This is a college took, that coach. That was a roundabout college. way to get to <laughs> college sorry. coach doing college coach things, man. I am going. So everyone who has discord at home, I'm going to turn off my discord alert so that you don't mm -hmm. think discord is popping off. By the way, we're at 900 subs way over there. I know. I don't know if that was purposeful. For it was, it was, you, you well pointed done. the right way. You pointed the right direction. <clears throat> yes. Um. Also, thanks for Brett. Brett was in the chat earlier. I don't know if he's probably still not here. Hey, Brett. Brett Whitefield in the chat. <clears throat> Appreciate you just it, stopping by. Is it a coincidence that Tebow and Jesus both came back at 33? Someone already made that tweet. It was very good. Mm, sorry. sorry. Really? <laughs> yeah. That is good, though. It's, it's very good. <laughs> I've seen some people, like, I think at this point, I'm... I've seen some people once again raising the pitchforks and yelling about why the hell does Tebow get so many chances and oh what about Kaepernick over here? You you got I think at this point I understand all those, but at this point it's kind of like we've been doing this Tebow thing for over for almost ten years now. I I think at this point it's just what it is. It's like it's like it's like a uh, it's like a, to a tornado that comes through or or a cyclone that comes through. It's like okay here here comes the Tebow front. Hurricane Tebow Tebow's here again. again. It's Hurricane this time Tebow's of year. here again. Yep, it's that time of year, man. Uh, do you think Do you yeah. think Skip Bayless just like woke up? Oh my god! And just like looked to the sky and saw like a cross in the sky. It, it is cloudy signal. here in L.A. It is cloudy here in L.A., and I'm sure that the skies parted just for him over at the Fox lot. Um, I So, like, guys have, like, made that transition to whoa. tight end before from quarterback, but not when that you played quarterback and bombed out of the league, sat at a media desk for about five years, then tried to become a minor league baseball player and bombed out that, then tried to become a tight end. I I have nothing to say about the Tebow stuff. It's it's it it feels. Aren't you glad? No, I don't. I don't. I don't have any. Like I don't care. I don't care. He, he's going to be here today. He's going to be gone tomorrow, and then great. We would have all wasted our breath talking about it. But we get jokes off. He could never be Logan Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Lion in London with the ten gifted subs. They're up to twenty in the channel. Appreciate that. Appreciate the support. Moving us up to nine ten, I would imagine. Uh, that's that's very very generous. Appreciate appreciate the support. Um, someone was asking how to do an Amazon Prime uh, subscription. I will show you that very quickly. So not you, after being out of the league for eight years. Has it been eight years? Yeah, Good God, it feels like a time about. warp. So you go to your settings over here. Boom, settings. It'll bring you to this page. Something called mm. Prime Gaming right here. Um. And I guess I already have mine set up. So maybe, oh no, you probably have to go to connections first. Then connect your yeah, Amazon well, account. Well, I'm sure, yeah. You're right going to have here. to connect your Amazon account over there. Yep. And, and then work. once you yep. do that, basically you go to your favorite stream. Let's just pretend it's Alex Reno. Obviously it's not, but let's pretend no, it's it not. No, um, no, let's, no, no. Well, let me, let me find someone I'm actually not sub to. Graham Glasgow. There we go. We're going to steal his content for a second. You click over here. And then there would be some free Jeremy, subscription with Prime. Stream sniping. And then you'd click subscribe free. I've already used my Twitch Prime, so I can't do it. But you can do it once per month, and it does not renew. So you have to do it every month. Um, 
And usually there'll be a nice little overlay on your screen that says, hey, use your, use your free sub. There's a free sub ready. That's how you do it. T- Tebow <clears throat> is chasing his dream. Here's, here's the thing at the end of the day. Um, chasing your dreams is cool. For a league like this that likes to say it's a meritocracy, um, jumping to the front of that line over other people who have been busting their ass as like, you're not the only person chasing your dream or busting your ass in the world. And I understand if people are mad because Tebow is totally leaning on the fact that like he played college ball for urban Meyer. Was it, wasn't he offered like five years ago? Weren't people saying, Hey, transition to tight end. will give you a chance. And he said, no. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that's also why I think like the people talking about like Kaepernick's day is kind of off because Kaepernick's not going to transition to tight end. So <laughs> no problem, Jeremy. Um, let me know if you, you have any other questions. You can always slide into my uh, Twitch whispers or go to a discord and, and tag Ooh. me um, in our discord exclamation point discord. If you're a discord user or want to be part of our discord team. If Ryan wants to answer it. Yeah, I saw that. Um, wedding planning is not very fun when neither of you are into it. <laughs> so neither of you are very organized enough to really uh, handle all that. I mean, I feel like we're oh, organized. You're, you're... Yeah, Jeremy knows his mic's undone. Um, right. But uh, yeah, I think if we were more interested in it, we're just not like we're not very. I, I got the caterer, so the caterer is all set up. Well, okay, that's you cool. Got the caterer. Felt like that was a big one. I feel like the three things you need are food, music, and booze. And that's all you really need for a wedding. What did Jeremy say? Everyone's like, wow, Jeremy. And a location, someone says. Yeah. Well, I got a, I got a venue, so... We got that figured out. It better not be the high school. I, w- I wish it was a high school. It'd be way cheaper. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I sat through my sister, some of my sister planning her wedding in Philadelphia, and that was not um, that was not fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, so, someone's now questioning about both of you not being into it. And some are like, is. Um. Jeez. Come on, people. You guys are funny. Can you hear us, Jeremy? Jeremy's looking very intense. <sighs> I don't think Jeremy can hear us. I don't know if Jeremy can do anything right now. Did we have did we get like Jeremy from like 10 minutes ago or something? Like 30 minutes ago, like the recording yesterday. Yeah, like we're just we, we've like somehow gone back in time. And here's Jeremy from yesterday working feverishly on an article on Pride of Detroit or like cleaning up. I don't know, Mike's writing or something. Um, Jeremy can't hear us, so let's, uh, what, what can we say to Jeremy? Uh, thanks, Joshua Mercer. It's happening yeah, in October. Yeah, October. Oh, wow, Wonder, that's a great time to do it. Yeah, it's going to be tricky, because there isn't a, a lot of, time. there isn't a lot of lodging up there. So, well, um, I, yeah, it's going to be tough. I say it's a great time to do it, but I know that in my line of work, that is like a mortal sin to half the guys I work with is to have a wedding during NFL season. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Sports has to come secondary at some point. No, right? I think but... that's, I think that's the right point, especially when how beautiful autumn can be. Oh yeah. And like, you're not sweating to death in a summertime wedding. Yeah. That, um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're definitely rolling the dice on, it could be like a, you know, it could be a warm October day or it could mm-hmm. be a, 42 degree weather day is it early october middle october what do you october 9th oh okay early then yeah so yeah you're right you're you're rolling the dice but it's still not as bad as like august or no 
LJ. It was, a, it was a warm spring too. Yeah. Hopefully when the schedule gets released, it's like, uh, it's like the lions bye week or something. <laughs> we are getting the schedule released this week for those, yeah, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, right? Yeah. Wednesday. And as soon as I know that day, I am calling my boss and telling me I want the weekend of Rams Lions off so I can go to it. Probably won't be able to afford getting into SoFi, but um, we're going to try. You, you guys can hear me, right? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. I can hear you, though. Why nice. Nice. There we go. Okay, we're good. We're good now. Sorry. <clears throat> oh, everyone's saying my, I sound different. Hold on. Oh, now, now they can't hear you. Hold on. Hold on, everybody. All right, now talk. Nope. Why is everything? How about that? Is that better, chat? Can you hear me now? They can't hear you. Hold on. Okay, I'm better. Now I need to fix you guys. No, they. they I'm good. They can't hear you. No, they can't hear now, us. Now they can He's hear you. Now, we're now they can hear I was I they didn't hear me saying some very embarrassing things about uh, my fetishes then. <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. Glad that happened during the break. I might need to get a new cord for my mic since this keeps happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we will probably uh, we've well, that's what the subs are for. We have a uh, war chest now. <laughs> right? So and you got so, you right? guys hear me clearly. It's not coming Wait, from the webcam. Did right? I get yeah. did I get silenced? No, what? he you, yeah. no Ryan's here. Ryan's we can, they can hear Ryan. There are a lot of people that was just saying that Ryan has been silenced. <laughs> I think everyone's, I think we're all good. Cause I can are we good? <laughs> we're definitely good. Chat. Stop scaring everybody. I just everybody. turned on, I just turned on chat. I just turned on the stream audio. I heard Ryan. Okay. Ryan is not silenced. Silenced by Chris's comment. J Russ uh, clarifies. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Good all right, point. Well, what, hey, you guys want to do a podcast or what? It, you know, what's really weird when everyone that, that's listening through my broadcast can hear you guys, but I can't, I don't understand how that even works <laughs> very carefully. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Let's get back into it. I don't know what that whole, I'm sorry. I missed out on whatever conversation you guys were having. You were just talking about weddings in October. Is, is that, I, I have no oh, questions. I, I, I guess, I guess the only thing we need to know from Jeremy, like, is, is that fine? Like I'm not pulling a bad move, am I? By like forcing people to come to a, a weekend wedding in a, in fall during football season. I mean, me personally, I don't like that because <laughs> I have to work during it. But I'm not I'm not gonna judge your you or your loved one for that. It's Fair enough. I'm just saying it's you don't have it's to a hard, convert it's to a hard my trade schedule. Off. It's a hard, but I'm saying for most for most men, that's a hard trade off because all of your male attendees, most of them are probably going to have something against you because they're li missing either a, a, their college team or their pro team. Yes, it goes to and on, on the other hand, it's beautiful outside. It's not as hot. It's tolerable. It's, uh, I mean, autumn, autumn food tastes great. Jeremy would be fine. He doesn't have a team that he watches on Saturdays anymore. Anyway, right. I'm, yeah. I, you know what? I decided this year, I'm just becoming a, an NFL scout on Saturdays. Yes. All I'm all I'm doing is watching Liberty games. Yes, yes. <laughs> Dude, we haven't even talked about Malik Willis this podcast yet. <laughs> Ryan and I have both um, become giant Malik Willis enjoyers against the average Keaton Slovis liker. Yeah, I know you have a USC bias, but Keaton Slovis. Dude, no, just no, 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 no. You you have to understand it's not a USC bias. It's I've watched too much USC, and because I've watched too much USC, I know for sure I want no part of Keaton Slovis. Are you excited for this, Jeremy? It's going to be draft <laughs> season all year long, baby. Nope. 
Oh my god. We, you, we gotta come up with a, a suck to something suck for luck type of thing. Don't you don't don't Malik rush it. Don't fleek. rush it. I know, I'm thinking hard though. <laughs> Malik is fleek. That, that doesn't that no. No one says fleek anymore. Quit quit trying to make fleek happen. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. No, he's not a Liberty quarterback, by the way. He's an Auburn transfer, and that's how I'm going to be referring to him. He's he's Hugh Freeze's quarterback. He's not Jerry Falwell's quarterback. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shatler for Rattler. No, I, 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 I think Rattler's got to show me more before, for in next season. Uh, all these guys kind of have to show you a little bit more in next season, I feel like. But Willis is definitely, like, the most intriguing of them right now. I all right. I'm just Ryan is just thinking. He's trying to come up with a good I slogan know. right now. So hard, so we're, hard. We're not even going to. Oh, be, by the way, we're not going to get anything out of you next segment because you're just like you're probably looking up rhyme.com yeah. right now, aren't you? <laughs> I knew it. By the way, speaking <laughs> of rhymes, I forgot. I do have a uh, I do have a haiku to redeem. So we'll do that after when we come back from the break. I do have a haiku <clears throat> to read. We are still giving away haikus from our charity stream about. Uh, five months ago, so "Kill Us for Willis" is from Captain James T. Kirk in chat. It's not bad. That's that's not a bad first one. I'll I'll take it. <laughs> I think it could work. It's a plea to the other team. We, we we aren't able to go into the second segment until Ryan gets out at least one one option here because I know he's just <laughs> it's you smiling at the <laughs> options. Play Meek for Malik. I like that, JDZ. Okay. Play Meek, Play for, Meek Malik. for Malik. All right. <laughs> it's uh, overly done, but that's the way these things are going now. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> how long before no D- for uh, no decaf hits affiliate on his channel? I just need to stream one more day. The averages are well over three. I've hit all the hours. Um. I've streamed for X. Uh, what what else is on there? I, I've got over 50. I've got like 80 followers now. So I just need to do tomorrow. Probably I'll stream for like two hours. We'll have fun and uh, we'll hit affiliate. And then I don't know what I'll keep doing with the channel after that. I'm going to keep keep streaming on it. But I need to make panels. I need to do all the stuff that uh, because I'm a pro streamer now, Jeremy. I'm a pro streamer. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, son. Going pro, going pro and streaming. I like this. What's this? Till this for Willis. It's a gardening thing. You have to till the soil. Till this for Willis. No, no. I still like I, I like no. JDZ's more. I, I think JDZ's got you beat. What is it? The play meek for Malik? Yes. What about drill us for Willis? <laughs> That's not bad. Okay. That's not bad. Okay. Okay. Put that up on a poll, Jeremy. Drill us for Willis or, or kill, or, uh, or kill us for, for Willis. All right. Or kill us for Willis. Kill us for Willis. Drill us for Willis. Play Meek for Malik. Let's get a let's get a, a poll going. I just I like I like the drill us for Willis so I can use the Riley Reed meme. <laughs> <laughs> it's good it's objectively good it's a really good meme all right well we should get back into this so reek oh reek for, for malik Jer- is not bad either reek for malik is probably mm, that's a good one <laughs> loses affiliate no loses a partnership <laughs> excuse me <laughs> <you. laughs> oh yeah Oh my God! Drill us for Willis is really winning out because, <laughs> of course, of course the, uh, of course the Freudian is going to uh, is going to win. You should be ashamed of yourself. I, I'm uh, not. I'm ready to put it. In play my foul Twitter bio. for Howell. You ready to put uh, it in? I'm huh? not. Stick Stop it. it! Fire it in there. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. All right. Ryan Money Matthews strikes again. Here comes the money. All right.
Welcome back to the Pride of Detroit POD cast. If you've been watching us live on Twitch, you just saw us deal with technical issues and Ryan coming up with a slogan to tank for Malik Willis out of Liberty. So drill us for Willis. You can. Well, I wasn't going to give it away. I was going to tell people (laughs) if they wanted to see what that's like, they can join us live every day on twitch.tv slash Pride Detroit. Not every day. Uh, We record in the off season, I would say every Monday, but sometimes those dates change. So the best way to know is follow us on Twitter at Pride of Detroit. We'll let you know when. But that's we usually do it around 6 p.m. on Monday. And you can have everything. And again, still download the show because that helps us out, too. Before we get back into it, we've been I redeemed the first of, I believe, seven or eight haikus we sold off during a charity stream we did back uh, late last year. I think it is time to redeem another one before we start talking about the tight ends. This one coming to you courtesy of Josh Harrington, who says, I think a haiku about the 2012 Thanksgiving game would be fantastically, quote unquote, Lions. So let me settle up to the mic here. Yeah. Pull my pull my uh, robe around me. Three kicks shall end this first Stu's, then Gunther's playbook. Hanson shan't overcome. Don't snap. We got we got scolded for that last week, Jeremy. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> snap on what? Oh, snap. oh, they, they, yeah, 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 yeah. You're being Intr- okay. That I, I, I thought I, you were going to snap on the fact that I'm bringing you back to, to, to 2012 Houston Texans <clears throat> Lions. No, I'm 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 kind of surprised you went the the field goal route there and not the the uh, Justin Forsett <laughs> uh, challenge well. fiasco. Well, the, 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 the struggle with a haiku isn't just like everyone knows right. it's five, seven, five for the syllables, but it's also supposed to be kind of cyclical, kind of like Finnegan's right. Wake. You <clears> want <throat> to end it on like a, a um, something that kind of turns it into kind of this like cycle. So it f- goes back in itself. And I figured the best way to do that was Sue kicking, ha- kicking Schaub, mm-hmm. Gunther kicking his playbook and uh, Jason Hansen's kick off the uprights. I think it was well done. Thank you. For I, w- sure. I wasn't trying to criticize it. I, was, I just no. I, know. I I like that you you took it in a different, uh, unexpected angle there. <clears throat> well, Jeremy's I- not the law. He just enforce it. <laughs> See the what the thing that rem- that remains with me for from that game is always going to be oh you just made him leave, you just made him leave, and his microphone's gonna be busted when he comes back. <laughs> if we have to sit through more technical difficulties i'm done oh god <laughs> i was gonna say i uh the one thing i remember about that game always is just it's it's always still going to be um Schwar- jim shorts uh throwing that flag that's that's what i remember from that game most of all yeah jeremy you can hear us right yeah unfortunately <sighs> Okay, Good. and okay. your mic still works. Awesome. And your mic Sweet. still works. Awesome. <laughs> cool. Well, fantastic. This is this is um this is what we get when we are partners and totally professional in the Pride of Detroit POD cast, the most reviewed Lions podcast on the internet. So let's get into uh, some tight end two talk. From that, from from haikus and the 2012 Thanksgiving game into tight end two talk. So uh kind of out of the blue this week. Josh Hill uh, suddenly retired. It was um, unexpected, Jeremy. I think we've kind of seen this more and more, though, with uh, NFL players across the spectrum where they just they just decide, you know, when it's time to be done, it's time to be done. And I can't fault Josh Hill for that at all. And I'll let you get to Josh Hill in a second. But I think the news was interesting because right before the news broke of Josh Hill, retiring that the lions were having a visit from a former lions tight end, Darren Fells. Yeah. Um, yeah. And eight, eight years in the, in the NFL for Josh Hill, he hasn't really come out and, and said specifically why um, he retired, but it became official it's a long on, career. On it's all a yeah. long career anyway for eight years in the mm-hmm. NFL at tight end. That's a long career. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why um, it, it's not our position to, to judge why. Um, but yeah, they, they bring in Darren Fells at the time we think, oh, this is probably has to do with Hunter Bryant, right? Hunter Bryant gets put on the NFI mm-hmm. reserve, which means he's at least out six weeks of the regular season, dealt with some sort of serious non-football injury. So Darren Fells is coming in to, to be that kind of reception role, you know, receiver role that, that we thought maybe Hunter Bryant could take over this year. Well, 
Turns out it's a little bit more serious than that. Um, Josh Hill retired. Lions needed TE2. They don't have a lot of experience there beyond that. A bunch of basically guys who have never played in the NFL. So they bring in uh, Darren Fells. Almost signs immediately. Signs almost an identical contract to Josh Hill. So in terms of cap hit, there's there's basically no difference. I, I still have to kind of figure out exactly what retirement means in terms of, of Josh Hill's cap hit. There's not It's not clear exactly how, how that all works out. But in the end, um, the Lions, I think, get a downgrade. Um, they, they certainly get a different player in, in Darren Fells than they do in Josh Hill. I mean, I was really excited about the Josh Hill signing, to be completely honest. I thought it was a, a fantastic signing. I thought... Everything we heard from New Orleans was this guy. It was you know you know the front door thing um, that that Sean Payton said like this is a guy that they built game plans around. And uh, when when he was out, sometimes they were left with their hands in their pockets, being like, "What do we do now?" And so you know, I know he was mostly going to play a blocking role in Detroit, but um, it was going to be a significant one. And Darren Fells is good at it. He's not you know, build an offense around good at it, but he's good at it. He's better than an average tight end at blocking. And he brings you probably more receiving uh, chops than, than what um, Josh Hill was going to give you. But I still think it's a little bit of a downgrade, but given, you know, the, the 48 hours they had to potentially, um, you know, rectify the situation, I think they did as good as they could. It's just a little bit of a bummer. Yeah. I, I view this as, <clears throat> pretty much like a lateral move. I know that we were really high on Josh Hill and what he would open up for. I mean, let's be honest. That's going to be the strength of the Lions offense this year is going to be their running game, you know, with their offensive line, their, <clears throat> their deep running back room. And, uh, you know, Josh Hill definitely seemed to, to fit into that plan. But I think what the Lions get in Fells is a guy who is two years removed from having 48 targets and catching seven touchdown passes. I mean, the guy has been a really effective red zone target. Um, I mean, just in his last three seasons alone, he's got 14 touchdowns. So um, this is something that's, you know, pretty impressive. I think, I think getting Darren Fells, I think that you could do a lot worse than getting Darren Fells. And it's awesome that he like immediately signed. I think that speaks to, I mean, he, he had, he had his time here in Detroit and it was with a different regime. So I think that must really speak to, what the lions have now in their front office and their coaching staff. I was going to say, because from what I remember when Darren Fells left here the first time after, uh, you know, during the Boston boys era, it was not on good terms and he did not have a lot of flattering things to say about the organization at the time. Uh, from what I understand at the time, it was a very deep rift, but, um, he's coming back in and seems to, I mean, as, as with all things, you know, you, you need a job sometimes in the NFL, but he definitely seems to, if you want to put a feather in the cap of is Brad Holmes and Matt Campbell, are they changing the culture of the lions? You want to put a feather in that column. The fact that Darren Fells came back through that door is uh, definitely, definitely in their favor. Yeah. And, and just to be clear, Fells never said anything publicly about the situation in Detroit when he was here. But from my understanding, uh, they did offer, I mean, he, he played well when he was in Detroit and mm -hmm. Detroit wanted to bring mm -hmm. him back and it became very clear that he did not want to come back. Yeah. No, ba based on everything not, that he's I not heard. a big fan. Um, he's so yeah, fan. yeah, I think you're right. Um, the fact that he's willing to go back to an organization that he did not really enjoy his time here, um, certainly speaks to, um, Dan Campbell. And I mean, Dan, I mean, if, if there's one position you think that Dan Campbell can probably scout pretty good, or at least, you know, recruit very well it's probably the tight the end one, position the and one he played in when he was in the league yeah, yes <laughs> exactly so um and then the other really thing to to think about i think with this move is that it doesn't change like it doesn't change anything for the future like josh hill is probably only going to be around another year or two if he even wanted to continue to play darren fells is you know i think he's above 30 at this point or, or approaching 30 yeah he's going to be 35 okay yeah he's well above 30 <laughs> Well, but the thing with Fells that's kind of weird about his career is he didn't start playing until he was 28 in the league. Mm. So he's had a relatively short career, albeit he's a little bit older. But I could easily see Darren Fells taking over the Jared Cook role of like tight end that always like sticks around for like another year and another <laughs> year and another year. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I, I, I was just going to say going forward, like I, I hate I hate to say this to a bunch of Lions fans, but tight end remains a long term need, right? Like. Kind yeah, of significantly they had their chance. So. 
They had their chance. They could have moved they, up. They had their chance. <laughs> you stop right. that. Stop that. Listen, I feel like you still need to kind of see what you have with TJ Hawkinson. Um, but yeah, if Hawk doesn't turn out here pretty soon, it's going to be, um, it's well, probably going to need be a need before long. Hawk, Hawk, Hawk has arrived. I, this has nothing to do with Hawk. This has everything yeah. to do with TE2. Who's the TE2 for the future? They, and I don't, I, I'm not going to sit here and worry about yeah. a TE2. Uh, but I'm saying like, it's, it's a neat, like you don't think Dan Campbell wants to play 12 personnel and put two tight ends out on there on the, out there on the field. I, I could see it. I I, I I think the Lions are probably going to be in 12 personnel most, like more so than a lot of other teams. That's what like, I'm saying. I, 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 would, I would venture to guess that maybe like they'll be in the top 10 in 12 personnel. But can I have a hot take about Darren Fells real quick? Please. He, I, have, he, I don't see why not. He might he might be the second best pass catcher on the team. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. <laughs> Behind who? Hawk. Behind Hawk. So the two best so, pass catchers are <laughs> our tight ends. A, a, a franchise tight end and a guy who just got signed <laughs> because I'm not the other guy because <laughs> the other guy retired. See, the thing is I can't really I, I want to come up there with you, but this would require me to slander my great and powerful large son, uh, Monroe St. Brown, so I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm, right. I'm just saying, who who has more, you know, touchdown catches over the last three years? <laughs> Him or, or someone or who has... <laughs> okay, so we're judging wide receivers and their, their, their hands by just touchdown catches. That's yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> Well, you said you, else. you said you were bringing in a hot take, and you actually delivered. This this was way better You're than welcome. your bold predictions. Well, by the way, Tyrell Williams, I, I did the math. He has one more touchdown than Darren Fells, but wow, not as injury Don't prone. Let facts. <laughs> Don't let numbers get in the way. Don't let numbers get in the way of that. That's true. Never Frank Ragnow time. Frank Ragnow time. Let's talk about Frank Ragnow. Put that uh, last few minutes of just flop sweat behind us. <laughs> um, Frank Ragnow got extended. He got a lot. He's now the highest paid center in the NFL. And if there's anything for me that says commitment to the offensive line, I think I talked about it with the Sewell pick. Now we're getting Ragnow extended. And uh, how long is he? Could, do you have the numbers on this, Jeremy? How, how long is he like guaranteed for here? Now? Well, the full breakdown of the of the extension is not yet released to the public, but. It's a four-year extension. He already had two years on his deal. So they're adding $13.5 million per year onto that deal, which means he's signed up until 2026. This is exciting. Um, that's Jeremy, this is so exciting. This might be a dumb question, mm -hmm. but what happens with his um, with his option year? Do you know the uh, answer to that? I believe it's just it's a year now. It's There, there is okay. no option. Like He's he's signed in to it, I believe. Okay. It's, it's okay. a good question, though. I'm actually not entirely sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think the, again, the, since the, the, the nitty gritty of details of the contract aren't available to the public, I think the assumption is that, uh, option year has now just been exercised. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And no, I, actually, no, they, they already did exercise it a, a yeah, couple they did. weeks ago. So they yeah, did. It, it, they did. so yeah. it's already been exercised. It's been added. Um, and so the four years are on top of those two years then. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a commitment to the offensive line. It's a commitment to, uh, culture too. I mean, we, we, we raved about Frank Ragno last year and, and not only, you know, his, his Midwestern kind of attitude coming from Minnesota and just being a complete team player, borderline captain, a guy who played through a fractured neck, um, and, and a pro bowler. Um, <clears throat> he, he's, he's just basically got everything you want from a talent standpoint, from a, from a personal standpoint. And, um, as, as Brad Holmes said in a statement, like this is a guy you build a franchise upon and center is one of the most important positions on offense. I'll say it again, because I don't think a lot of people realize it. Center is one of the most important positions on offense and the lions yeah. have theirs for six years. So that's, yeah, that's exciting for, for me. I, I think it was one of my like early takes on this podcast too, was how much I feel like we don't talk enough about what centers will do for your offensive line. And you have that. And Decker is, you know, I, I think he does. He has. He's until twenty twenty four. Twenty twenty six. Sewell twenty twenty six. Oh, no, I'm sorry, sorry. Dec you said Decker. Sorry, twenty twenty four. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, twenty twenty four. I think there might be something in there that maybe you can. Uh, something so. for twenty twenty five. I I'm I'm just looking at some numbers here real quick. I, I have these all like you. I have a lot of papers scattered around here digitally. And then Sewell's, you got his 
rookie contract until however long that either that goes there. So yeah, it'll be either four four, four years four, with five, a fifth option. So you're looking at both corners on your offensive line and your guard. Uh, I mean, and your and your center um, set up for a very long time. I think Decker, you know, if he keeps playing well, he'll probably just keep re-signing with the team too. And you know, right now the guard's a little transient. I feel like maybe that's a need for next year, Jeremy. Um, maybe not. I, I would say a day one need. Maybe like day two or day three, depending. Um, depends but- on Vitae. Depends on Vitae and depends on Jackson, but I mean, that's a hell of a start. That's a hell of a start to something that's just going to continue to give you dividends to uh, whatever you want to do on your offense. That's, that's long. This is long-term we're talking here for the NFL. We're t- that's at least like, you know, we're talking for five seasons of something that doesn't get enough credit, but is absolutely crucial to running whatever offense you want. Just set in stone. Like, forget about quarterback for a second. <laughs> Just like every every team needs an offensive line, and your your quarterback, no matter how good he is, isn't getting those throws downfield without this set. And these guys play better when they play together for a long time too. This is um, this was this was good money. This was good money spent for the Lions. And I think I think you've talked about before, Jeremy. Like this is a long term plan for Lions. This is a sign for long term for just long term thinking, if nothing else. No question. Uh, the one other, yeah, the one other thing I, I wanted to mention is that the Lions kind of historically for the past couple of decades, they've been pretty set up at center. I mean, Rayola played for the better part of 14 years. Mm-hmm. And then there was that brief transition where Travis Swanson showed Swanson a lot of promise was, yeah. and just concussions ended his career, um, you know, too short. But uh, and then th- there was like the weird thing with Glasgow and I think Glasgow could still like probably play center somewhere in the league if he wanted to. Um, but he's just kind of. I think become more comfortable as a guard and now the lions have Frank rag now. So that's, um, I mean, that's definitely some place that you want to establish stability along the offensive line. Like we already mentioned. So it's good that the Lions got that done. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like we'd be doing disservice to, to Frank without mentioning his emotional press conference, because if you weren't a fan of Frank rag now before, I don't know how you couldn't after ever watching. I don't know if you guys have, have had the heart to, to watch it. Cause it's, it's an emotional thing where he, he talks about how much this meant to his family. Um, you, you know, he, he talked about his, his childhood dream going back to the, the, the day before he, he signed pen to paper. He was over at his mother's house and they were looking through his school projects. He found a school project where he said, my dream is to go in the NFL and support my family. And just kind of coming upon that, that paper hours before he signs uh, the biggest you know, life-changing moment of his career. It's, it's an emotional moment. And, um, unfortunately didn't get to share it with his dad, which, you know, if if you, if you think back to his introductory press conference for the draft, his dad was his best friend. Um, was there every step of the way he, he, he said, you know, he says he owes everything to him for where he was today. And, you know, (laughs) I, uh, I actually missed out on the press conference live because I was working on a piece, you know, an article and, and I'm kind of glad I wasn't in on that zoom because it was very emotional just to, to watch. I was watch. I ended up, you know, just watching it live on YouTube like everyone else. Um, but you know, it, it, you know, not, not to make things too personal again on, on the POD cast as if we, we, Oh come, no. When, when have we ever do. done that? Jeremy? By all means, <laughs> put your guts out there. But, on, but on. I know that exact pain that he's going through in that you accomplish one of the biggest things in your life. And the first person you want to share it with is your dad. And he's not there. We got credentials for this website a couple months after my dad passed. And it felt weird not being able to share that news. I mean, I mean, when, when I first got the call from the lines, like I instinctively looked for his number on my phone and uh, it's, it's tough. And so seeing those raw emotions from Frank is something you don't really see a lot with. I mean, you see it, you see it here and then with NFL players, but a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of, you know, big man mentality where people don't want to share their emotions. People, you know, people say, you know, don't, don't share your emotions on the internet, that sort of stuff. Um, but it's just, it's refreshing to see, and the guy is super likable. And damn it, I want to buy his jersey so bad, but I'm not going to. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to do that, Jeremy. 
Um, also, at the same time, uh, thank you so much, Jeremy, for sharing that. But I, to, to bring it back to maybe a lighter news, the other part I like from the press conference is that uh, this, this, he, he basically put a trip to a fishing trip aside to come back in and sign that contract and went right back up to the UP to go catch some bass. <laughs> so that's very, that's very Midwest as well. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Man likes to fish. I mean, who doesn't? It is, it is the off season, baby. Bass ain't going to catch himself. So true. All right. Uh, I think we're going to take a break here when we come back. Uh, I think we got some hot takes. We got more hot takes. Uh, there has been some rumblings about a rumor from the draft that Jeremy wants to touch upon and uh, get out once again his, we'll just call it a fetish with trading down. <laughs> We'll, um, we'll, we'll call it, we'll call it that. And, uh, we'll, uh, we'll play, play around a little bit more close up shop. And, uh, as we said, it's the off season. So plans kind of go out the window. Lions talk flows though. And we keep taking your questions and doing more here on the pride of Detroit POD cast. Uh, really quick chat. I don't know. Uh, can you guys hear alerts, chat? Because I can't hear the alerts, sadly. Um, if I keep saying what? If I keep saying closing up shop or what? What do I? What do I keep saying, LJ? <clears throat> I know I've been falling in some big, some big, uh, big. Re- my my brain's been mush, so I'm probably like repeating words. Yeah, I'm not sure why the alerts. Oh, fetish. Are not okay. <laughs> Alert box. The the audio's on. Is the al- properties I can't my friends asking what this pod is about a lot of fetish talks test widget can't do that i'm sorry damn we're, it. We're, we're, damn partners. It, Chris. we're twitch partners folks i i still don't know what that means <laughs> undo it means we're partners it means i work for mac jones <sighs> this cast of fetish is absolutely not that is for POD after dark. Yeah. I'm not sure chat why the alerts aren't working, but let me just catch up with them anyways. Jeremy Schmidt. Thank you for the Twitch prime sub. I'm glad you figured out how to use it. Lefty Detroit dropped another five bomb or was it? No, that's a five bomb. Appreciate that. CGC 816 subscribe with the tier one. Welcome. First timer. Appreciate you joining us. And then cake man 1218 just followed. Appreciate you. Um, I'm assuming the alert thing had, has to do with all of the audio issues we dealt with in the, in the first break. I'm sorry. That's that probably what happened. That's probably what happened. You, you <clears> would probably have to start the stream and restart it to get them back. Yeah. So lefty is acting a fool right now in the chat. I told you we can't do it. He redeemed a list cast <laughs> and he wanted us to list cast our fetishes. Mine, mine just involves a butterfinger. Like that's all, <laughs> that's all you need to know. I'll do football fetishes. How about that? The it wheel involves a butterfinger and a picture of <laughs> Kyle Pitts. Oh God! I thought you were going to say someone you had already already mentioned once during a break. <laughs> no, stop. <laughs> what I think of you people. <laughs> See, I respect the list cast, and yet I can't do it here. You know what? Tune in after hours on at no decaf on Twitch and maybe I'll get I'll deliver it there. <laughs> Football fetishes trading down the wheel route and returned field goals. Those are my three. Oh. <laughs> those are my three wow. football fetishes. How about that? Wow. I, uh, I wonder what you were like to be around when you saw that that Auburn return. I would. Oh, God. I think that's part of the reason why it's one of mine is because I wasn't. I was working at the time. I was working at a dog kennel at the time and I didn't see it. And suddenly my phone blew up and I was very mad that I missed it. Uh. So I actually missed it. uh, I missed it in a fashion. So my story on, on that, on the kick six, if you're not familiar with the kick six, that was the end of Auburn, Alabama, this, the iron bowl of 2012. Um, Davis was it? uh, What was his first name? Uh, Jeremy Davis. Or is that oh, a no? No, no, that's no, no. a ESPN for nails. Personality. Everyone knows what the kick six is. If you don't know what no, the no, kick no. is, go Google it. The Chris Davis. It was Chris Davis. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah, it was Chris Davis. So uh, Alabama ties the game. 
uh, after well, like well, Al- Alabama had put a schnocking on Auburn for the entire game. Um, they trade back and forth a little bit. They Auburn ends up tying the game, but Alabama gets the football back late. They set up for a field goal with no time left. I think actually like they were supposed to go to overtime, but Nick Saban jockeyed with the with the refs and got uh, time second. put back on an extra second put back on the clock. And he lines up for what was it a, a, a 67 yarder field goal just to see what would happen. Was it really that long? It was a long field. I, I don't think it was that long. It was it was over 60 yards. It was a long 57 says okay. from that dude snoots. Yeah, you remember better than I do. It was still for college. 57 yards is a long, long field goal. And they trotted out a freshman to do it because they had missed like three field goals that game. Um, It falls short. Chris Davis runs it back 107 yards or so for the touchdown to win Auburn. And basically Auburn gets to go on to the national, to the sec title. And from there, the national title because of that game. Um, So when I, I was watching that game live and Alabama, you have to understand Alabama had like a 21 point second quarter. And I kind of gave up after that. I'm like, all right, I've seen this before. Alabama wins. We all lose. Screw this. I'm ordering a pizza. I have it on the background and I, you know, I, I think I turn it off before the fourth quarter. I get in the car and I'm living in Savannah, Georgia at the time. And they carry the Alabama radio network. Eli Gold, wonderful, wonderful broadcaster. However, Eli Gold, um, and, and I know that the Auburn broadcaster, his call is famous. He's late from us now, um, which is very sad because he has a great call on that play. But I was listening to Eli Gold. I'm going over to get my, my pizza. And Eli Gold calls the play, but he delivers it in such a down-tempo fashion. I don't, I'm not paying attention. I don't realize they've run the ball back to win the game. And I shut off the car. I go inside to get the pizza. It's on the TVs and Auburn people are storming the damn field. Um, And I'm like, what the hell happened? And then they show it on replay. And I'm like, wow, holy crap. And then I remember, wow, the woman who owns this pizza store is an Alabama fan. (laughs) And sure enough, it took me like a good 10 minutes before I could get my pizza once she stopped having a fit. (laughs) Understandable. Sorry, that was way too long of a tale. I just like telling that story. I like telling the story, man. That dude Snoots is an Auburn fan. Yeah, I know, Jay man. That's that's still. Like... I is there an is there an equivalent Lions moment? Is it just like the the Stafford fake fake spike? Is that as close as we've gotten to a crazy ass moment like that? But it's not in that big of a spot, I think, is the thing. I think Ryan maybe has thought of a similar situation, though, for our sphere, sphere of sports. You're muted. You got to you got to unmute. I still think I'm I'm, I'm still trying to think of a Lions one. Oh, I wasn't going to say Lions. The Hail Mary against us our... can't count. No, we're talking about <laughs> the end of Lions. Titans. Good moments regulation. for Lions games. Lions Titans. I, I, I don't know if you guys remember everything that happened at the end of that Lions Titans game. But I recently came upon a, a a YouTube video that was titled something like the craziest NFL game you've never seen. And that entire fourth quarter was just bonkers. Psychotic. Yeah. Bonkers. I mean, take your pick from 2016 for me. Um, I think see someone in chats mentioning, you know, golden Tate overtime against Minnesota. That was a good one. But that again, there were so many good finishes in that 2016 season i'm hard pressed to fit to pick out one because i remember the philadelphia one was pretty nut, uh nutty too uh the second minnesota game where i think that was on thanksgiving and didn't darius slay have an interception that set up for a game-winning field goal yep. um bam sadford um, <laughs> dislocated shoulder game is a pretty good answer too. stafford rookie season browns just the only difference there is there wasn't much on the line, right? Those are two losing yeah, teams. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's just, it's, I think what happens with kick six is like, there's no time left on the clock. It's the stakes involved. It's the special teams play that you're not seeing. It's as Gary Danielson was saying on CBS, Alabama has only fat guys out there. 
on the line to block for the field goal. They don't have athletes. It's all of that. Everything put together that makes that gumbo so delicious. I think the uh, I would put the finish of the Lions in London versus the Falcons up there. Yeah, that's pretty crazy yes. finish. Especially when yeah. what was it? Did Dan Quinn call like a t- he like tried to ice the kicker or something? Yes. I yep. yeah. The Lions yeah. had a wait. Was it a it was delay? A, of game? It, was a lo- it was a delay of game, right? Oh, it was a delay of game. Yeah, the Lions got a delay of game on a missed game winning field goal, and they got a second shot at it. Right? Yeah, because he called the timeout, right? Before the delay game. No, I think the Lions had a timeout. No, no, that's what it is. They were going to get a delay a game, but Quinn called a timeout to try to ice the kicker. No, I I think I think the delay a game happened. And they had to kick it from five yards back. God, it's, My brain it's is been mush. so long that we haven't. Yeah, it's we been, don't that's a that. long. What was that, 2014? A game? Jeez, I don't even know. Because I remember 2015, we got our ass whooped by Arizona. In, in... Yeah, it was 2014, yeah. All I know is that the kick six is the only important or notable special teams play that finished a, a rivalry game <laughs> in college football. <laughs> That's all I know. Yeah, Jeremy, you're right. It was, it was a 43-yard attempt that was going to be wide, but they had to delay a game, so then he got to kick it again. From 48. Yeah. Stack, I don't know what those words mean, Stack. Those words don't make sense to me. trouble with the snap. I, no, I have trouble with those words. I don't know what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, legitimately is, I think that's better than the return field goal. That, a bias yeah. aside, that was just one of the most insane plays that have ever happened. It was in insane. I, I, however, I am fueled on Schadenfreude against uh, Nick Saban, so I, I still lean kick six. But that's close. It's very close. We're, I, I don't, I don't even know. What, yeah, kick six. What, what else were we talking about? Yeah, I don't know. See, I was trying to lead Ryan there too, and I'm like, there's something else in the sphere of the sports we watch. Yeah, I was trying to say that without saying Michigan sports, but I'm just an idiot. So Aussie punters, huh? Mm. I don't know why the mute button doesn't work for me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Are we going to we're going to do this? I'm on 8 battery, so I'm going to just grab my charger. Okay, go grab your charger. I need to think of what else we're because we want to do your talk. And what else were we going to? Oh, we can. I can go. I can go 15 minutes on this. Really? Yes. By himself. By myself. That's what I'm afraid of. (laughs) (laughs) Even if not, we'll just have a shorter podcast. It's fine. Okay. I don't want to just try to shoehorn something that. None no, of I, I think we've anyway. I think we've been actually pretty good on time so far. I think we're this one's clocking in right now around thirty five minutes. So I don't mind doing shorter ones. I just you know I was just curious if there was anything else we wanted to hit. I know there was that because if we don't hit it during the podcast, I feel like we should share with uh, chat the horrible indie wire comedy of the last two decades. <laughs> Or was it of the last decade of the 21st century? I, I almost don't want to give whatever indie wire is the attention that they're very much seeking <laughs> by putting sideways as their number one comedy since 2000. And stiffing Will Ferrell and Adam Sandler from the list. Where's Jackass the movie? Why is that? <laughs> yeah, none of the Jackass the movies are on this. Uh, Tropic Thunder didn't make it, but somehow like Thor Ragnarok did. Team America, World Police. And it's not even an aversion to just yuckle, like, you know, lowbrow humor, because Team America, World Police is fifth on here. <laughs> any, Where's any list, Batman vs. Superman? Any list of 45 top comedies from 2000 that doesn't have Walk Hard can just get the fuck out. Can walk on out. <laughs> can walk on out of here. That is a good point. It's fantastic. For, for as dominant as Will Ferrell was in that stretch from like, really like at the turn of the century, I feel like that's yeah. when he became like move a movie megastar. Isn't it wild that his like counterpart, John C. Riley, has the best comedy film of all of them? He's a better actor, too. That's a hot take. That's not even the Matt Damon Leonardo DiCaprio stuff that I got for you. 
I was going to say John C. Riley actually acts in like serious stuff too. Like I went back and um, Magnolia, we, we have like, dude, I was just going to say he was in gangs of New York. Boogie nights. Mm. He's awesome in that movie, dude. John C. Riley, one of the most underrated actors of all time. Oh yeah. Absolutely. He's got huge Absolutely. acting chops. Then he's got, I, he's I think got I great remember, range. Yeah. Yeah. I think in, in an article that somebody was writing after uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman passed away, like him and John C. Riley, they were on Broadway and they would like switch roles every every night they performed. Yeah. <laughs> and like, yeah, John C. Riley's got acting chops, man. He's dude. that dude. And the fact that he There's does some like guys some who, serious yeah. shit like like Magnolia, like a, a really, you know, maybe I mean, you could probably call it pretentious, but like ser- really serious, really ambitious movie. And then he can go around and just do Tim, Tim and Eric's awesome show and just be a <laughs> drunk, like mentally challenged doctor <laughs> is ridiculous like who who wants to do both of those things there's not a lot of people that bo- that love, desire to do both those things and you mentioned the broadway thing i love actors with great range to do that kind of like serious stuff and even some acting stuff like i i just i was reading the other day i had completely forgotten daniel craig was iago in a production of othello wow and i would his, pay to watch his, that yeah his iago was apparently fantastic like, because the thing with Iago, I, I studied a lot of Shakespeare in high school and college. Um, a lot of people try to reinterpret Iago. And it was a great article, I think, in New York Review of Books a few years ago that I stumbled upon. That people try to reinterpret Iago to give a reason for his evil. That there's like, you know, something either wrong with him or there's like a sexual undertone to what he's trying to go after or something. They try to explain it. And the article is like, no, like. It's just hard for people to understand. Iago is just evil by choice. He is supposed to be evil, and and Daniel Craig plays him as by choice, just not caring about the humanity of others. And uh, yeah, no, I, I I I love that. I always love when I see someone who can act at like Royal Shakespeare Society and that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. So Aaron Rodgers pay for that. Yeah. What about? Oh God, we haven't even talked. We should talk a little Aaron Rodgers in the last segment. <laughs> We talked about no? him during the draft. It's fine. It, that, that's like two week old news now. It literally is two week old news now. So what do you think? I, I did want to ask you, because what do you think? Because I know Adam Schefter was like trying to defend himself. Yeah. A little bit on dropping that news before the night of the draft. And he was I, basically saying it wasn't a report. It was just a collection of information he had assembled through the months. Yeah. So, yeah, he was on Dan Patrick and basically said, like, yeah, there wasn't anything that day. There wasn't a report that dropped on his desk that day or a phone call he he got in his mailbox or anything like that on draft day. It was just, yeah, an accumula- accumulation of things that had happened in the off season. I mean, it, and it wasn't a complete secret either, right? Like we all remember the reports that the Ram- before the Rams traded for Matthew Stafford, they called the green Bay Packers for Aaron Rodgers, And now, yeah, now that that day before Schefter's report came out, I think there had been a report from some, I think we dismissed it, Jeremy, because it came from some Minnesota radio guy, but like, the 49ers tried knocking on right. Green Bay's door for Aaron Rodgers before the draft. Right. And so, yeah, I, I guess there's people who are questioning the ethics of just like in the middle of the draft when everyone's paying in the NFL, you drop mm-hmm. this report instead of either. Yeah, and I know it early or Horn's, for it either. I, Joe Horn was mad about it, too, because he said it overshadowed his son, J.C. Horn's uh, big night and everything. But I mean, I don't think we were paying attention to J.C. Horn. Sorry, Joe. Yeah. Well, I mean. Here's the thing, like once the draft started, we weren't really talking about it because there was a billion other things going mm-hmm. on and a billion other storylines going on. And I don't know, like I, I, I don't really see anything ethically wrong with it as long as everything you said was true. And by by the accounts of hundreds of other reporters now that are basically saying all the same things, he was right. So fine. Drop it, drop it while everyone's watching. Why not? I will say this on the matter. Um, this is exactly what Schefter and Rappaport are supposed to do, though. Like, this is why they exist. The spigot is going to give you NFL news, whether you want it right now or not. They're going to decide on when to drop it. They know when to drop it to make the most impacts. We all go nuts. Like, this is getting mad at the scorpion stinging you. This is just their nature. So Jeremy gets pissed at the scorpion every every week during the season because it's like four forty five in the morning. <laughs> right before it's like there is yeah, there's got to going to play this day. I'm always up, so I used to handle those too because it used to be like we'd get a bunch, and I would be at work up at night. 
um, and it would drop at like one in the morning on the on the on the West Coast. Like, there's got to be some sort of like uh, moratorium or something that lifts at that hour. I get, yeah, I don't. I, I'd lo- I'd love to hear the story of that because it feel like it only it started happening like two years ago, a couple of years ago. Yeah, where yeah. it's just like okay, we're gonna talk about inactives at at literally midnight on Saturday night. Why? Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't. I don't, like don't do it. that. Don't do that. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure there is something that has to deal with like after midnight across the continental U.S., which is why it happens at like four in the morning. By the way, there there is currently a heated debate right now between Leo DiCaprio and and Samuel L. Jackson as, as some of the best actors of all time with with great range. I gotta put my my I, I've got I've got to stick up for us Guidos. It's Leo. Where's Matt Damon in this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Dude's got range. That's all I'm saying. Oh no, Craig's, oh boy. Well, let, let's get back into this before we, and then we'll deal with Craig's impromptu list cast on the other on the other side. All right. Welcome back to the Pride to Detroit POD cast, wrapping up the show here. Once again, another great sh- time with chat about um, bad comedy, a bad comedy list from IndieWire, which um, people get mad if we go off topic here. So I'm going to steer us away from that. And instead, I have to give the floor to Jeremy to once again, rant about not trading down, which we have already determined is one of his fetishes <laughs> in the NFL. Um, but Albert Breer report out and this week, the Lions were apparently getting trade offers that would have the, that was, I I think quote solid trade down offer from seven from where they drafted Panay Sewell. Uh, It was, I believe what, what was it, Jeremy? A third rounder throw was going to be like thrown in there. I believe we we don't know the details of the trade. Basically Breer put out a a really interesting story. And if you haven't read it, I, I, I certainly suggest to go, go reading it. But he, he oh, right. ta- you were the one you were the one suggesting yes, I, third round. That's yeah, why I'm I was throwing out a hypothetical. Here. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Yes. Go in. Yeah. Go in the Breer. But yeah, the Breer, Breer, Breer basically, you know, he talked with Brad Holmes. He talked with Dan Campbell about everything that happened that night, about how excited they got for Sewell and all all that sort of things. And in the midst of it, Brad Holmes kind of spills, spills a bean and says, hey, yeah, we, we had a, a, a competitive offer on the table when we were on the clock at seven. Um it was a trade down to a spot where there's where we theoretically would still have a chance at Sewell. So you have to think basically trading down to eight, nine or 10, probably no further than that because Sewell dropping out of the top 10 wasn't going to happen. Um, but they decided Sewell was their guy. They loved him. They had decided, you know, they had had a zoom call with him earlier in the week that basically made it, you know, so sealed the deal he even said after the, the draft to us, he considered trading up for Sewell. So, begs the question, one, did he make a mistake? Not, well, okay, so let, let's, before before we talk about the specific, whether you, you would have been okay with the Lions trading down to seven, eight, or nine and getting whatever it was, I want to bring up a bigger point, and it's one I, I briefly touched base on during our, our locker room on Saturday, which is... Did Brad Holmes fall a little bit too much in love with some of these prospects? Because not only did he almost trade up for Panay Sewell, he almost did it for Levi Onzerike. He did do it for Derek Barnes. He, he thought about doing it again uh, with, I think it was, was it the corner? I think it might have been, the, I think it might have been uh, the corner. But basically, he's talking about all these guys that he was super excited to get and, and almost went up and got. And, and all these high character, high football guys. My concern throwing this report in here is that, yeah, maybe he got a little too hyper-focused on one guy because, listen, you get you get some of these wrong. And if you, if you box yourself into one person, you suddenly shut your eyes to, to other potentials. Like, the, on, the Lions aren't going to succeed because they only got Panay Sewell. There are different routes to be successful. And maybe Brad Holmes seriously considered all these other options. Maybe he didn't. But... 
the one consistent thing that I heard from him over the three nights was he had one guy that he had in mind and was was locked in on that guy. And and to me that's that's at least mildly concerning. And and so I mean, listen, I don't think it bit him in the butt this this draft. I think he did get get good value everywhere you go. But you know who also fell in love with some very specific guys? Matt Patricia fell in love with a lot of specific guys. He fell in love with Jelani Tavai and and grabbed a guy that didn't have to grab at that point because he fell in love with that guy. So I, I see a lot of people you know, responding to my minor criticism saying, no, 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 you just go out and you get your guy. That That's a great strategy until it stops working. And I know we all want to have a lot of faith in Brad Holmes, and I do have more faith in Brad Holmes than I do as Bob Quinn as a scout because, one, he has a much better resume – from the Rams than, than Bob Quinn did with, with the Patriots. But I'm just saying there's a danger in going out and getting your guy and not understanding that there are other guys out there. You're not always going to get your guy. So maybe don't get too aggressive and either pass on better deals or get aggressive and trade up and get your guy because that could get you in trouble. The best way to, to ensure that you're giving yourself the team the best chance to succeed in the draft is to maximize your draft capital. And I think there, there may have been an opportunity that he dropped the ball there. That is all fair and good. Um, however, I, I think this was the right move to stick with seven. I think that, you know, maybe it's just the way he talks sometimes. Maybe he's just excited afterwards when talking about guys. And again, I, I think a draft is mutable. Sometimes you do want to trade up and get guys. And sometimes that is the right the right decision to make. Um, I think when it comes down to it, though, is you just look at the board that was there past Sewell and like yeah there was definitely certain needs for the Lions and we saw if they had traded down to like eight or nine probably uh you know uh, they're 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 probably drafting one of those corners that went off they're either certain or horn or maybe they're even going after wide receiver maybe even as people wanted Justin Fields kind of hard to tell without knowing what was next on the board maybe even Rashawn Slater he went 13 but I think the value I mean again you don't I don't know what he'll become when we're talking about someone who started on Oregon's offensive line at the age 17, I don't want to miss that. <laughs> I really don't. Um, and I think it, it's not even just going for a guy you love. It's going for a guy you love that is going to be, that fits a strategy that the Lions are pursuing too, which has been to, and we've seen it now between Sewell plus the Ragnow extension, which is to invest in the offensive line, to set that as your identity for years to come. Uh, I think I'd probably have to see whatever trade offers were turned down, but I think when you're in the top 10, you just go and get, unless you are getting a massive King's ransom, then I'm not interested in moving away from some of the talent, especially in this draft where we saw after Sewell, there was definitely a step down uh, for, for value at certain positions for certain premium positions. Uh, the only one that really hadn't gone off the board at that point was corner. And did the Lions need someone like J.C. Horn or Patrick Sertin? Um, Maybe, but I think they got better with Sewell. I, and maybe they would have gone down further and missed out on more on more uh, top talent. Maybe had to go with the next tier down, but I don't know. Maybe this is a case where I love Sewell, but I think at, at some point... The value is great, Jeremy, but at some point, like, you do need to land your guy. Like, but you do need you do. to get someone who is going to be the guy who you think is not only going to fit in your system, fit with everything your scouting has told you, and is going to chart to be that guy that you need for the future. But he's also got to be available at the end of the day. And we definitely, we saw the risks of that, right? When the Eagles war room is right. is mad as hell at the Lions for because they, they sniped them on someone they wanted because they traded down. Well, let me respond to a couple things there. One, this is not just about the Sewell pick. I like Sewell a lot. I think he's he's a great pick there, and I, I get that. It's it's more just consistency. The overall strategy, I get that. Is, yeah. is falling in love with your guy. Second of all, fuck, fuck that Eagles trade. That doesn't that, <laughs> that does not count towards this because if you're trading three spots for a six rounder pick, that's not a good trade down. I don't care about that extra six round pick. Throw that pick in the garbage. When you're at the top of the draft. You get more for your buck when you trade down. You move down three spots in the first round, you're getting a hell of a lot more than you are a sixth rounder. Second of all, when you're at the top of the tra- draft, you're getting better players even if you do trade down. There are better players available. So to me, when you're in the third round, the margin of, of difference between player is is not, I don't care about trading 
down or up I, once you get to round three because the the you're, you're usually not giving up or getting many resources when you do it at the top of the draft though that's when you get the real value of trading down because you still get a shot at a really good player and brad holmes said himself if they weren't going to go with sewell he was either going go, there's two other guys he didn't name them but he said one of them played a different position and one of them played a very similar position to sewell so he basically said rashawn slater was right there in the cluster of players he was willing to be willing to take and so you trade down a couple of spots where he says he could have gotten Sewell, potentially could have gotten Sewell. Well, he probably wouldn't have, but he could have gotten Rashawn Slater. And that puts them on the exact same track that they are, but probably with at least a day two pick. Well, I think I think the the issue there is, again, it's a matter of where they go because Rashawn Slater was immediately snapped up. In by, 13. 13. Yeah, at 13. At 13. Again, it they all depends trading, on where they go. They weren't going to trade back that far. He, Brad Holmes said... He, the offer was at a spot where they thought there was still potentially a chance they would get Sewell. That's not past 13. I can okay. guarantee you that. I have some thoughts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so first of all, I, I think, I think I, I see where you're coming from, Jeremy, and I, I can understand it. But the one thing that really stuck out to me about the Breer article was the unity that everybody had when it came to Sewell being the pick. And it's not so much the fact that they took Sewell at seven. Yep. It's that they all needed to buy in on it. So it almost seems we're talking about all these things that almost happened. Like, you know, he almost traded up for Sewell. He almost traded up for uh, Anzawerki. He, you know, uh, I mean, he did eventually trade up for Derek Barnes. But, like, I think the thing is, is that all these things almost happened, but they didn't because sure. maybe not everybody in the room was on board with it. So, like, yeah. hey, if I'm if if we had a war room, I would pound the table for my guys, and I would be. You think you guys wouldn't have to fight tooth and nail to get me not to trade future assets to get Kyle Pitts? You're out of your goddamn minds. <laughs> but like, the thing is that everybody needs a governor on them, and maybe that's one of the things that Brad Holmes excelled at, being the director of college uh, scouting for the Rams, like with less need. I mean, there, there's I feel like there's so many times yeah. like one person can't be making all the decisions. I think that was the problem that. I think that was a problem that Bob Quinn ran yes. into because he was essentially kind of, he was the, the voice in that room for Matt Patricia. Yep. So like that kind, that didn't really do much because the type, the type of players that, you know, Matt Patricia wanted, he wanted like the opposite of the kind of guys that, you know, Brad Holmes prioritizes, not saying that they're going to instantly be better draft picks, but I still think that Brad Holmes adhered to his principles and like he relied and leaned on his staff when when he needed them. So I, I get where you're coming from. And there's like maybe like a dash of concern. But at the end of the day, like most of those things did not happen. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Th- no, that's yeah, that's a really good point. It is. And I think John Dorsey, you, you have to imagine his voice was, oh, yeah. was huge on, on draft weekend. And and I mean, we also have to consider the fact like this was Brad Holmes' first draft. This is his first time in the captain seat. Uh, so yeah, he probably got over eager at times and got really excited about certain guys. Or maybe oh, maybe, he got excited. <laughs> you think Brad Holmes got a little excited bit? Maybe a little day? bit. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> I was but, gonna say too. Maybe this is just him just being earnest about there too. It's like yeah, maybe I I thought about maybe trading up, but like you know he can think that, but then that doesn't come across either. Like yeah, that gets shot down by committee, or it's like. He, he thinks that at first, but then rethinks things and is like, OK, no, maybe that's not the right thing to do here. Let's just see how the board plays out, which is basically what happened at the end of the day, too. Yeah. And I mean, he he said specifically, like there were times at which, in which the, the room calmed me down and, and, and talked to me kind of not off the ledge, but like off the, <laughs> you know, off off the table, oh. maybe <laughs> off the table, no, dancing on the like, table. I totally get it. Like as to, to Ryan's point, like this is the draft is basically it's a high. It is. I, I, the cliche, I would, I, I hate to use the cliche, but high stakes poker game is probably the right way to go where it's like, you're just looking at who's in front of you in that draft. And, you know, we, we can all do any kind of mock we want sitting here as fans, but ultimately you're at the mercy of everyone in front of you, what they do, who they trade with, who they pick, where those things come to you. It's not always an ideal situation. So yeah, I get it. Like if, if you're, I, I would be stressed as hell. Yeah. Well, and, and and to to put a button on this and, and to prove that I'm not just like I'm freaking out about Brad Holmes and thinks he's a horrible <laughs> GM, he said it himself. Like one of the things he learned from the draft was patience. 
And it was from those around him. And so I hope he does carry that forward. And I hope he doesn't necessarily get locked into one specific guy. Because like I, I continue to say, like there, there are more routes than one to success in the NFL draft. And um, if you, I think if you get your, you, you lock onto one guy, you're opening yourself up to, to a whole bunch of trouble because sometimes if you just miss on evaluations. Everyone does. The best GMs out there miss on evaluations. Um, so I, I hope he learned. Um, those, those safeguards might not be there forever. John Dorsey might not just be hanging out in the Lions front office forever. Uh, Ray Agnew could potentially get a, a GM job somewhere else. So eventually it's going to at least be more on his shoulders than it probably was this year. And, and I hope he learned from it. And, 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 and like I said, like nothing went particularly wrong this year. Maybe they missed out on an extra day two pick from trading down and, and getting a guy like Sewell instead or, or, or whoever you had as your OT2 or OT3 that, that might have been able to step in at right guard and be at least in the ballpark of what Penny Sewell will be. But if, if that's the worst thing to come from in the draft is that the Lions didn't get an extra pick, like, well, then hell, he must have done a, a fantastic job. So I'm, I'm willing to ride this out. I'm just, I'm just, uh, there's just, like I said during the, the, the locker room, there's just a voice in the back of my head that's like, uh-oh. Yeah, you're Mr. Trade Down. You're Mr. Uh-oh. Trade Down. But listen, uh, you you said someone in Panay Sewell's bar, ballpark. Let me be clear. There's no one in Panay Sewell's ballpark from that last draft class. We'll no see. one. We'll see. No one. Right, right tackle position, not even a left tackle. I know. <laughs> no one. No one. Well, let, let's hope let's hope that doesn't get clipped in play for you in three three years. <laughs> I am always wrong on this podcast. <laughs> you, should know, you should know that by now. Not, not well. I mean, I'm not always wrong, but when I'm wrong, people try to own me with being wrong. And let me tell you, I there's been enough people who have beat me down and told me I'm wrong in my life to the point where I just I don't care. You could own me with that all you'd like, as long as you're not leaving a one star review saying Chris sucks on on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> Are we getting out of here? Yeah, I think I think we've uh, chewed all the fat off this bone. I think all we're right. uh, I think we're good. I've Ryan, just got a couple Ryan's of got, things to say. What's up, Ryan? I you're gonna make me want to defend the den. Drill us through Willis. Let's go. Everybody I is a flame. Let's go. We uh, we shared that it, Ryan shared that athletic article. If you haven't read it yet, on Derek Willis, the quarterback at Malik Willis, uh, Malik Willis. What I say, Derek Willis. My yeah, my bad. you're being adequate. Malik adequate. Um, Malik Willis, who is the Auburn transfer down to uh, Falwell U, uh, Hugh Freeze's program, Liberty. Fine, I'm, I'll, I'll stop being petty. Um, but uh, is there a lot of Kool Aid in the article, uh, reader? Uh, listener you best believe like that kool-aid was oozing out of the pores of myself and ryan matthews spilling all over the pride of detroit slack in a very slick scene um i'm i i really want willis i i need to i need to see who else is going to step up in 2021 but uh rest assured someone's going to be watching liberty football i have their schedule as a background on my phone oh my god i will absolutely never forgive you (laughs) <laughs> for getting us into somehow squeezing in 2022 draft talk in freaking May. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's happening. You know, it's happening. This t- everyone wants a new quarterback. Everyone's <laughs> news n- new wants new shiny toy before Jared Goff plays a single snap in a lion's Jersey. Jeremy Reisman is the biggest Jared Goff fan for this reason alone. Yep. The, the more he can stave <laughs> off draft talk, the better. I mean, Malik Willis is not going to be there at 30, so who cares? With the no, Rams but he pick? will. Yeah, and the lines are going to be 32. <laughs> Damn, you, Bam! You sniped, my, you sniped my joke. I was going to say he's going to be there at five because that's where the Rams are going to be picking. <laughs> Lions, Rams, NFC yeah. Championship. We're calling it right now. Ew. Ew. I don't want that. I don't want my be loyalties tested. I don't want my loyalties tested this early, Jeremy. You would want that? Absolutely. What kind of what kind of emotional toll will you undertake oh, by watching that football game? It will Jeremy? absolutely destroy me. But we're talking about the Lions in the NFC Championship game. But that's all that matters stop. in that equation. You want to be stepped on by Matthew Stafford? That is disgusts me. Talk last talk about checked, fetishes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> last time I checked, Ben Sewell's projected receptions for twenty twenty one not great. Zero. 
No, and not a playmaker. Not not a playmaker. No, you just got nice feet. Speaking of fetishes, <laughs> okay, we hit too here. many. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, please bind yourself to us. With, uh, by subscribing on the podcast, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. Um, no more jokes. We're out of here. See you, Starside. Rex Ryan's favorite podcast. <laughs>